All right, Molly, if you're ready, I'm ready. All right, our next conversation is gonna take you into a little different world. And it is with great pleasure I'm going to reintroduce Molly Carmichael, who I introduced to you yesterday. Molly's a principal with the advisory side of the world. And if there's one thing I'd zero in about your specialty, because she does a huge amount of research in consumer, product, and everything else, you are a segmentation expert. And today, you're gonna to talk about retail programming and profitability in the master plan. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Molly Carmichael. Good to see you again. Jims, we're waiting for a mic here. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Oh, there we go, here we go. Well, welcome everyone, uh, you are in for a treat. So as Tim mentioned, I work on a lot of master plans. And I think one of the biggest challenging things that I find when we're doing master plans is they always bring in that, should we do retail? Do you have to do retail? How do you make retail work? And there are so many key things, I think, in making it work. And you have two of the best guys in the country that actually have learned to not only make retail work, but it, it's an amenity and it's great. And so we're gonna start off, I wanna introduce our special guest. We have Rick Severance. He's actually the president of Welland Park, but his background goes deep. One of my favorite things is he was the previous CEO of Seaside, one of my favorite communities. Also president for Babcock Ranch, another big favorite for me. But he came into Welland Park, it was a scattering of villages sitting right next to the ocean, but there was nothing to really, in my opinion, glue it together. And he came in and did a beautiful job of just transforming the place. So we're gonna hear from Rick first. And then the second person we're going to, to talk to, um, a young CEO, a uh, Yuri man, he's actually another genius, um, largely in the Lagoon development side. Again, he's the CEO of Lagoon Development and he's also the EVP for Land Tejas. And they've just been converting master plans with what you guys all know very well to be lagoons. Uh, a cute, fun story, I went to a lagoon, actually, and I, I went to it, and if you haven't seen one, you have to see it, because it's overwhelmingly beautiful. But the thing it does for that community is, anybody who ever wanted to live on the beach, that's what this really does, and it really transforms the place. But it does more than just for housing, it does a lot for retail. So I'm gonna turn it over to you first, Rick. Tell your story, and I wanna know just how you make it all work. Uh, I have a lot of questions a team on effort financial. Is, team effort yeah. is how I make it all work. Uh, for yeah. those of you who don't know, Welland Park used to be referred to as the West Villages. Uh, we didn't own the name, the trademark, or the URL when I got there, and it's hard to do what I do or what you do without those things. So we branded uh, to Welland Park. We're about 12,000 acres. We're in Sarasota County. We're about eight and a half miles from uh, the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, currently, we have 15 builders, five multifamily builders, and we sell about 1,000 homes a year, give or take, if we have the supply, which last year we didn't. Um, this will be my sixth downtown, so one of the things I want to reference is uh, every single place I've been, I've skinned my knees, uh, and I've learned from the people around me and the team and the land planners, and so I'm fortunate that you're able to kind of have a tool belt, and then every time you do a new one, you're able to do things maybe a little bit tighter. I, candidly, Welland Park was the first time I've ever had a completely blank canvas. Uh, everything else, I'd either inherited a land plan or came in to get a company profitable. So this was really, really fortunate for me. Um, on the profitability and programming, I had to understand the gap in the market. You know, we're in Northport, and I have a friend here, Laura, who used to refer to it as NOPO. It is the furthest thing from that. It's been phenomenal in terms of a, a, a municipality to work with, but there was no there there. So kind of creating that and understanding what we needed, and I'm not joking when I say the best place to take your wife to dinner was Applebee's, like the finest restaurant within seven to He's 10 not miles. Kidding. 
I'm not kidding. So we knew kind of the mix. We had to understand the merchandising mix through data. We had to understand the ask and the take rates, specifically on rents and TIs. Because we're back to, if you're going to create it, is it going to be an amenity or is it going to be um, something that should be profitable unto itself? For us, it needed to be both. And so the, the math associated with those decisions early on was extremely important. Um, also, we were starting to become multi-generational where we hadn't been 10 years before. So previously, call it 85%, we're 63 and over. We started getting all, you know, we have four new schools within the four years I've been there. That gives you a sense of the demand. So we wanted to create a place that felt like, uh, I use this analogy, if it's not a great place where the grandkids want to come, the grandparents won't buy. But, you know, COVID proved to us the kids won't want to come back and be around their, their parents either. So we wanted to create a place that felt very comfortable and casual, but again, profitable. Um, land planning for us was the key. Uh, it was very collaborative. We did a charrette process, and it was with Kimley Horn, Stan Tech, Street Sense, and myself and, and our team, and that proved, that proved positive. Um, we created a video, and D3 created this similar video when I was at Babcock for us, and it was front-facing. So if you'll indulge me, it's not maybe a minute long. Uh, I'd love to show a video. The, the reason we did this, we created this video when we had the multifamily contracted and the downtown, but nothing had started. So. Fingers crossed. Uh, the intent with the video was really, we played it in the Welcome Center, we used it to entice builders, we used it to entice residents. Um, the, the key was it showed the perspective, it showed lot depth, it showed the building elevations. We had the CAD files, so creating this fly-through from a digital perspective uh, was, was beneficial to us. It created the sense of place when there was nothing there, which was really important. Um, I will say, we made an investment in shade. As those of you who know who live here, especially this summer, it's been brutal. Uh, we relocated 40 mature oak trees from the ranch. Seven of those, eight of those oak trees were heritage trees over 60 years old. Uh, one of them was 100 years old. And so we put that in the epicenter of the downtown. Um, and you can just start rolling the slides. The images will show, uh, or the images will show some of the stuff I'm talking about. Um, the other key was credit worthy tenants versus regional tenants. That's such a challenge because when you're trying to be a market maker, you know, though we had the public's anchored shopping center, getting the folks that could make sure they paid the bills, especially if you were doing percentage rent was tough. I will tell you, I, I made a mandate, and this is one of my lessons learned from my previous mistakes. Uh, we didn't do one single lease with somebody that was a vanity interest, meaning Mr. and Mrs. Smith, Mrs. Smith, they had retired and she wants to open a Lily Pulitzer store. Yeah, I, I can't do that deal. Uh, anyone that we did a deal with had to have at least three to four doors elsewhere in the region. They had to understand the business model. They had to understand cross-pollination and, and staffing. Um, in the downtown, and I'm, I'm assuming this, this slides will come up, uh, we, ha we chose four architects. Uh, all four, are, now that's different because, you know, Rex and Laura with, with Waterside, they used LRK. It's absolutely stunning, gorgeous to look at. We were mandated that we wanted it to look a little bit more organic that came up over time. And so what we chose is four architects that I had worked with in the past. Architects working together in the sandbox and playing nice together is a really art. It's an art. Uh, you have to be really smart about making sure these folks work well together because the peer review process is as important as anything else. And you want, the, you want there to be um, a collective wisdom in terms of how the place looked. We did things like angled parking, uh, which doesn't sound like a big deal, but it costs a little bit more, not just because of our demographic, but we wanted to slow the traffic down. We did uh, paved streets. We made sure that the buildings looked as good from the back as they did from the front. I consulted with the villages for, I don't know, a year and a half uh, from a consulting perspective. And one of the things I learned outside of, you know, don't <coughs> sell green bananas when you don't have to, was really making sure the experience from the time you park your car to the time you get to the event or to the restaurant uh, was, was very, very thoughtful. So we were, we were smart about that. Um, we, create a, we created an entire area called the yard. 
and you'll see it maybe afterwards. Uh, the yard is repurposed shipping containers. Uh, we did that purposefully from an incubation perspective. There were tenants, uh, there were prospects that we really loved the idea, but it didn't warrant the tenant investment or the, the TI investment on our part. So I couldn't get food trucks. We originally were gonna do permanent food trucks, but this happened during COVID and there weren't any. So we did the repurposed shipping container area, and it's uh, one of the, my favorite areas in, in all of, of Welland Park. Um, I would say Solus Hall is probably one of the things I'm most proud of. And back in the seaside days, we did a wedding venue, and it was a chapel. We ended up doing 200 plus weddings a year. We double stack them. You do two on third Friday and two on Saturday. I don't know who would do that. My daughters wouldn't. I can <laughs> promise you. But uh, but I learned that it, it created this vibe, this energy, and even Friday nights in terms of rehearsal dinners and those kinds of things. Um, so we created this beautiful venue. Uh, called Solace Hall, but we designed it to also be a performance stage that overlooked the Grand Lawn, so it served two purposes. And having done a few band shells in my past, there's something about an elevated sense of place, and we can program that. So that was that was our intention. I'm, I'm probably as proud of that as anything. We're already into our sixth or seventh wedding, which is proven great, and then there's live events on that stage every Friday and then Wednesdays as well. Um, I'll keep going, I guess. All right. Um, Programming, you know, you can take everything that's off the shelf, you can go to every one of our websites and there's probably 30 to 40% that's the exact same everywhere, whether that's movie night or what have you. I really feel strongly that the uniqueness of events is essential. For us, it was stuff like the Luminescence Festival where we've, you know, it's luminary bags and you'll see images maybe of, we put uh, the yacht club, the youth yacht club in the water and all of their sails were illuminated. Uh, we just tried to do something a little bit different. People could pay homage to someone that they've lost and write that on the luminary bag and put that in the water just to create some visual aspect. Uh, we also did stuff like, we have tailgate Tuesday. Everyone knows in the retail business, Tuesday's the low day. So we did tailgate Tuesday. Yes, that's corn hole, but there's more to it. So if you participate, we're giving, uh, we do it every month, and you get tickets to the BCS championship uh, if you come. It doesn't cost us much to do that. And then every single week, um, yeah, every single month, sorry, we, um, we uh, have a raffle where we do e-bikes because mobility is really important to us. Um, we do Artscape. So we do Villa, Via Calori where you do a chalk art festival, but then we're also doing an entire mural, something I did on a small format when I was at Babcock. This is a much larger format. It's 400 feet and all the neighborhoods and communities come and they paint little squares. So uh, trying to engage the community. Something was said earlier about community. It's not buildings, it's not bricks, it's not food and beverage. Community is people. And without people, there's no soul. So the intent is, how do you create a place that has a vibe where there's a soul? And to me, that's as important as anything. Um, what happened around the commercial core when we started to do this, so we brought in eight brand new builders, which we hadn't done before, five new neighborhoods. This is Solus Hall, and we do a digital projection art festival, and then we do this specialty, and this gives you an indication. So residents don't even know when they come what the, re, uh, the reallocation of the projection art might be. Um, we've added, I said, however many builders, 600 new multifamily, two new hotels, a Costco, a uh, new 250 bed hospital, 450,000 square feet of medical office, all because we were showing this and this video in terms of what we were selling the dream, if you will, and it was easy. This is actually a real shot. There's no Photoshop here. This is the Luminescence Festival with the, the youth uh, sailing in the, in the water. Um, one thing, and then, and then I'm closing, you know, for us taking retail off of your traditional Thursday, Friday, and Saturday nights is essential. You've gotta get these folks busy, especially in June and July in South Florida. And so we found that fitness was a way to do that. The meetups in terms of cycling clubs and running clubs, uh, I call it the stroller brigade. Everyone laughs at me, but when, when the moms drop off their little one at VPK, but they still have one in the stroller, they're all meeting up. Now they may be drinking champagne or Prosecco, but most of the times they're drinking coffee. And then they go around our lake and it's created this vibe where you got 25, 30 ladies who are meeting up together, creating community. And it's in the off peak times when you know, nobody is traditionally open for, for dinner. Um, I said, listen, or I say, listen to the residents. And if you have to pivot, pivot quickly, have fun. Not every idea is gonna work. 
uh, but also you got to give it enough patience. A great idea sometimes needs time to root, so don't just give up on it because it may not have huge participation. We're already pre-leasing phase two, uh, and we're intentionally communicating with the, res or the tenants. We are not going to cannibalize on what they're offering. We have a pretty heavy food and beverage offering in phase one because it was needed. We are not doing a heavy food and beverage offering in phase two, only first watch, because we need a breakfast lunch venue. Um, I would say our commercial core was intended to serve, to, to serve two purposes. Yes, it was going to be an amenity and it cost as much as a golf course, but it was also supposed to rise the tide for all the builders and all the future prospects. And I feel like, and I have a lot of builder partners in the room who thank you so much for helping us be successful, but this, I think, intention uh, created the catalyst for them to want to be a part of Welland Park, and they had never been a part of Welland Park before. So thank you. Thank you. You know, I have a, a page and a half of notes, but I'm going to go really quick here. Uh, and I'm going to ask you the two biggest questions. Sure. How many people do you need to actually do what you did, rooftops? And then as you look at that from a profitability perspective, how long or did you have to subsidize? Uh, it's a great question. So if you look at the radius outside of where the commercial core is, because we had really successful neighborhoods, Island Walk and Grand Prairie, so have about 5,000 residents in each one of those. Right. <laughs> Excuse me. We already had 12,000 rooftops within two and a half miles of the core. So the built-in demand was there. Um, we just need to get them out of the clubhouses. And they were clamoring for that. You know what I mean? If they were playing Mahjong on you know, Wednesday, they were back on Thursday night because there was nothing else to do. Well, they all felt like fenced in kind of communities with no core. And that's really Yeah, nobody had created the hub uh, and created the connective tissue to get them to feel like they were part of something bigger. Their neighborhood kind of trumped the West Villages. Now I think Welland Park has created the sense where Welland Park is the hero brand. And one last question, one last question is, is how long did it, um, one, did you have to subsidize? And then, um, and how long did you have to subsidize? So remember, we, everything you've seen has been open less than a year. Mm -hmm. So we just opened, we turned over the buildings in October after the storm, and then TI fit up. I mean, we're at 90% operations right now. Um, I think if you looked at the pro forma, we're only gonna have to subsidize for maybe a year and a half. And if you didn't have 10,000 rooftops, how many would you have waited for to start this process? I would have started smaller. Keep in mind that everything you've seen is less than 50,000 square feet under roof. So we didn't start. We scaled it so it felt bigger. There's a large format green. Uh, there's the playground. There's the splash pad. We have event lawns. We have a hotel site. So it feels grander. Plus, it's on an 80-acre body of water around a four-mile uh, four trail system. That was a man-made, right? Yeah. We did that as part of the land work. Okay, fantastic. And you have to see I it. I think this is the video. I don't know if it'll play, but we'll see. Maybe. There we go. Woo, woo. Nice. Thanks. Okay, we get five extra minutes for this. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's great. So these are the trees that you saw that we saved from the ranch and the rival experience. This is our multifamily. Again, we have 600 multifamily units within a quarter of a mile. You see the angle parking, signature shade. And remember that all of this was done before we turned dirt on anything. Uh, you can see the large format tree. We have a rooftop deck with oak and stone. Uh, they opened last week. This is that Solus Hall that I referenced, which was done by Corey and Vote, the architects I'd worked with when I was at Seaside. They're the town architects for Alice Beach. Um, and then Tramplin and Pier did the mixed use building here. We're 100% leased and we were a year ago uh, and 100% operational. Tramplin and Pier did the Pearl Hotel for us when I was at St. Joe which was exciting. This is our signature restaurant on the water. Uh, this is called Banyan House. You'll see some images. I think you saw one of the inside. It just won one of the interior design awards. Again, we created spaces that can be functional off season. So it's canopy green lawns for weddings, which you've already had outdoor weddings that, and then they'll do, they'll do like the, rece uh, the ceremony in the courtyard and then they'll go inside for the reception. Um, again, this is from the rear. This is the parking lot arrival. So again, back to why do we want to create uh, buildings that look as good from the back as they do from the front. So uh, the images that may rota rotate will show you the actual sense of place. This was done three and a half years in advance of us having operations. So, thank you. And in part of the research we did, I think we consciously really pushed you guys to go a little more modern Florida. And, it's, and that was really to get the light, indoor, outdoor relationship and some of that stuff. So super fun. Yep. 
Yuri, I'm so excited to hear what you have to say. Well, Molly, thanks for having me. Dive right in. I don't know if you can hear. I'm, I'm a fan of your podcast, by the way. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, thank I, you very much. I was here uh, yesterday, and I was um, at one of the mixers, and I started talking to people. What's the uh, first thing you think about when you hear the word retail? And uh, we're, I think somebody's response was, I'm wondering what my wife is shopping for right now. <laughs> so, um, but today my husband wonders a lot, too, just right. so you know. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, retail. I'm, I'm with Land Tejas and also the Lagoon Development Company. Land Tejas is the largest developer of master plan communities in the Houston market. Um, I, th I don't know if my PowerPoint will start playing, but if we can get that to work, that would be great. Um, and uh, typically the, the company is, de is delivering between three and 5,000 lots per year. Um, and the Lagoon Development Company provides services in terms of development and ownership of the Lagoon concept. We are a customer of Crystal Lagoon, so Crystal Lagoons is the technology behind the uh, Lagoon projects. I don't know, are they going to have the uh, PowerPoint or not yet? We'll keep talking. It should be popping up. Before we begin, if I can ask yeah. you just a couple of questions, sure. too, since we're waiting for the PowerPoint to come up. You know, one of the biggest questions, and I cannot tell you how many master plans I'm working on throughout the country that ask about lagoons. I mean, it's like bringing the coast anywhere in the country. And the, the question I get are two big ones. I hope these are okay questions. Anything, <laughs> anything that okay. matters now. Cost per acre to build it. Yes. And then what is involved in maintaining it cost monthly as it, you know, burden to HOA or whatever that is. It's, it's the number one cost I get constantly. Yeah, so our, our first lagoon that we built uh, at Balmoral, which is a two acre crystal lagoon, uh, including the entire eight acre amenity village and the lagoon, including the clubhouse, we spent about 17 million in 2017. Today, that would be about 25 or $30 million at least, that eight acre amenity village. Uh, which includes everything around the lagoon, the beaches and all the amenities that you put around the lagoon. And then we spent more than $40 million on the Lago Mar Lagoon, which is the, uh, the larger mothership, which is in Texas City. So here a little bit about our company. Uh, you can see over $200 million in lot sales in 2021, $500 million in 2022. Uh, we currently have 14 active communities. The Lagoon Development Company has two uh, crystal lagoons operating. Um, and one under construction in Dayton, Texas, and three in planning. Um, and today I'm gonna to talk about retail and how we leverage the Lagoon concept within our master plan communities to also make retail more successful and profitable um, in allocating commercial uses around the Lagoon. Uh, this is our first Lagoon that, you, that we talked about, which was a two acre crystal Lagoon. This became known as the most successful master plan community in the Houston market selling uh, over 700 homes in a single year. Um, and then we gapped out on lots, otherwise we would have continued. But this lagoon proved that it was able to attract um, home builders. And as you know, our main purpose, of course, like other master plan community developers, is to be a great partner to our builders. We wanna sell the homes quickly. We wanna make sure that our builders command great premiums, if they can, on their home sales, uh, that they get a lot of foot traffic into their models. So the so this was our, our first taste with the lagoon, and we added um, our first bit of retail inside a master plan community at this project, which is the Blue Lagoon Bar and Grill. This was uh, the first restaurant on a crystal lagoon in the United States, um, and we won many awards for this project, including Best Recreational Center, um, and with uh, Lago Mar, uh, Best Master Plan Community. And we've also been able to attract higher density uses other than single family homes inside of our communities, partially because of the lagoon concept. So here, for example, we have townhomes for rent and townhomes for sale inside the same pod in the master plan community, not on the perimeter, but inside the, the community. We also have uh, Belcara, and the developers of Belcara are here today, the single family homes for rent. It was our first time having single family uh, for rent in a project on the perimeter of the lagoon. And then this is Lago Mar. Uh, Lago Mar is a 4,000 acre master plan community. It's one of our projects. Um, and as you can see, most of the retail is uh, on, the, on the interstate, Interstate 45, which connects downtown to Galveston. We, were, we sold land to Bucky's to build the Bucky's here to the Tanger Outlet Mall. And then um, the, the south part of the, of the project is the first phase, which is 2,000 acres. Um, and within the 2,000 acres, we created a mixed-use entertainment district 
to leverage retail and create a sense of place around a Crystal Lagoon. So you can see here, for example, on, on the, the, the Crystal Lagoon, where it says Crystal Lagoon District, there are different colors around it. Those all represent different potential uses that we would allocate around the lagoon and, of course, sell those, that land at a much higher uh, price. We're selling the land uh, around $20 a square foot now for, the, for some of these parcels. And then on the highway, we have uh, retail, which is uh, shielding the uh, residential from apartments. So allocating sort of retail in a master plan community, I kind of think of it as like when you invite your family and friends over for Thanksgiving dinner. It's a sort of you want to minimize the people from getting upset with each other, right? So you have to put people in certain locations at the dinner table to kind of <laughs> make sure that it's like a well thought out puzzle so you minimize the amount of aggravation between, the, between your guests. It's the same thing here, is that we have different types of retail uses. So you can see, for example, the red retail right on the highway is, is hiding your apartments. And we don't want the apartments to be right at the front door because that sets a bad tone for people who are thinking about buying homes. They don't want to see renters as they come in. But you certainly need the apartment renters because you're going to have all of this retail and where are the people that work in the retail going to live so you're going to need to have apartments so everything needs to be well thought out and we we play with this and change it multiple times in many iterations with lots of great consultants to try to come up with what is the best way to minimize the anxiety between the different types of uses where do we need to have the walls where are we going to make sure we have enough parking and because, of course, with restaurants, if you're planning to have restaurants, which we like to have around the lagoons, those, those need 10 parking space per 1,000 square feet versus if you have just office or some, some other type of use, uh, commercial use. So as you can see here, uh, this project, by the way, uh, all the lots in the first phase, 2,000 acres, have been sold out. And the Lagomar East is now um, in development. Um, and I want to show you. Uh, this is kind of already an old aerial, but it gives you a sense, you know, the market here, 6.7 million. We have, we're, one of the things that's very important to us when we pick a parcel of land, especially because we always have retail, is that we, we do want to be near a major, um, thorough, uh, major highway like Interstate 45 where you get visibility, especially with the lagoon concept. We want people to see the lagoon to create a marketing window which will help sell the entire master plan community. It's all about selling homes. And similarly, we have typically between 10 and 14 different active builders in the projects. Um, this is a, a video about the uh, project, which I'll play real quickly. It will give you a sense of what this 100-acre uh, mixed-use district is, is like and kind of how we sell the homes. Let's see if we can get this to play. Oh, we didn't, the video didn't play. But that's OK. So uh, the Lagomar 100-acre mixed-use district here you can see we allocated the west side of the lagoon to be primarily residential. So we have a residential clubhouse with a residential swimming pool on the left-hand side. Then we have future condo hotel units on the north side, a location for a hotel with its own beach. Uh, in the green, we have um, a mixed-use district, which will have apartments and a waterfront, uh, uh, a waterfront boardwalk with restaurants and bars. Um, and then the blue is the public access beach club. So this lagoon has a beach specifically for the residents, and then it has a beach club for the general public, which is also a major driver for future retail. So to prove that we can attract people to come here and buy food and beverage, which also helps to attract the potential restaurants, we open up the lagoon to the general public. We feed about 250,000 people a year at the lagoon. And then we also have the restaurant that's at the lagoon as well. Um, and how do we come up with this kind of plan? I, we, you know, we had a well thought out plan with multiple experts in master plan design um, to, to, to identify how these uses can all work together. Where can we have the restaurants that are going to benefit from the, the visibility on Interstate 45, but also have views of the lagoon? Where should we put the beach club so that people who are coming to the beach club have to drive by? the uh, retail to make, to make the retail more successful. Um, and somebody asked me, how do you make the sausage? I, one of the things, this, this, I was renting an apartment uh, during, uh, in the last few years in, in, in Miami Beach, and I had this swimming pool here. 
And the swimming pool, basically, I was staring at it all the time, and I was looking at, and it was very similar shaped to Lago Mar. So it was, in my mind, part of the way that we design the different uses is, is constantly looking at this. And this is what the, the lagoon will look like in about um, five years from now as we continue the development of the project. We're right now in the title company with a group called Resia, which is going to build 600 apartments um, on the shore of the lagoon, and they will leave the boardwalk undeveloped so that we can develop that in the future with a, with a retail partner. Uh, this is what the boardwalk is going to look like on the east side of the lagoon with the restaurants um, and the, the, an example of the architecture of those apartments. Um, on the southwest side where you see those townhomes, we have um, uh, identified uh, Encore development that's going to bring a hospitality product. These are sort of like Airbnb short-term rental townhomes. Um, they're really hospitality product. And then on the north side of the lagoon, northwest side of the lagoon, uh, we're now um, partnering with a developer to build Hilton branded condo hotel product. Uh, this is an example of that product in Orlando. Uh, it's very successful. And we also have uh, the National Sailing Club at the lagoon which is uh, an amenity that helps to uh, drive uh, more traffic to the project where people can come and rent sailboats and paddle boards and kayaks, catamarans. We have about 80 different vessels at the lagoon. Um, you can see here, go to the next slide. Um, so th I, I mentioned the, the paid beach access. We currently have, uh, th this summer we broke a record for our most successful uh, summer, we had over 500,000 people come to the lagoon, and this is a highly programmed uh, public access facility where people can go on a, a floating obstacle course or a, a, a slide. They can rent a paddleboard or a kayak. We have, um, you can get a, a VIP lounge uh, cabana or an, a cabana that actually floats inside of the lagoon. So there's a lot of really special experiences that you can participate in. And we've become basically a super regional attraction, uh, bringing people from all over the state. And about 8% of our visitors are, are even from other states outside of Texas. Um, and this is a, a, an example of an advertisement for, for that uh, beach club. Uh, I think the volume is not working, but that's OK. But you get a sense of um, kind of how we advertise to the general public. And of course, we have a lot of signage at this where we're inviting people to come buy homes uh, when they're coming to the Beach Club experience for what we call Lagoon Fest Texas. We have big signage when you walk outside of the, when you're leaving, you, if, you were, if you bought a home here, you'd be home by now. Um, when it rains, we invite people to go back to their cars and visit the model home parks. So we're able to really leverage this amenity to drive home sales. And we estimate that with these types of lagoons, which are in our projects, we're able to increase the, the foot traffic to our models. They will tell you about 10 times as much foot traffic on, uh, compared to the projects without the lagoons. Um, something new that we're doing right now. Uh, is called Lago Mar Live. We have eight large-scale concerts. We built the first floating stage on a crystal lagoon. Uh, we have the only operating floating stage in North America where this, uh, basically the general public can come to a concert and they can so fun. be in the water and watch their favorite artists. We had uh, the Eli Young Band, uh, Jared Neiman, lots of big country music artists are coming here. And uh, we at, we're, we're now going to have an EDM festival at the Lagoon as well in the future. But again, we're creating a lot of visibility for the community with this. And the residents usually have their own area that they can come to the concert. And they, so they feel special and invited to be part of this, uh, which they can walk to from their backyard. Or they can come in their army of golf carts that they, they like to use to, to arrive at the festival. Um, just quick, real quick, this is uh, just a ground view. You can see this is, um, this is the Eli Young Band performing. Um, and we, you know, this is uh, Congressman Crenshaw rented the facility for his, uh, for his own party. So he had the Tim Montana performing at the Lagoon. And I yeah, <coughs> like to see these little videos. Um, so we're, this is the future beach club that we're now um, about to start construction on, which will be more like going to a five-star hotel open to the general public. It's called the Tropicos Beach Club. And we, we came up with this design by visiting. I got lucky enough to visit 10 different beach clubs as part of my research. That's very important. And we came up with this great design, which is really creates a, 
uh, almost uh, like a fashion show out of the people arriving at the lagoon, which helps to make the, the project successful. Um, and the next thing that we're doing is really designing lagoons as uh, the centerpiece of public attractions, which have high value parcels with retail, with views of the lagoon, hospitality, restaurants, and bars. This is an example project that we're doing in Cyprus, Texas. Uh, this is a new project that we're developing a lagoon on in Dayton, Texas, uh, which is uh, called River Ranch. The, the lagoon is called the Angel Lagoon. It's currently under construction, uh, 7,000 homes and 2,500 acres. And the lagoon, again, is at the front. And as you can see, a lot of the same discussions that we had on the last project. We are obviously lining the highway with retail and uh, we're picking the depths of the parcels depending on what, what kind of retail will be there. So for example, if you have a, uh, a grocer, you want it to be at least a thousand feet in depth versus other types of uses. Um, and this is the lagoon master plan so you can get a sense. It's a four acre crystal lagoon and it's gonna have um, some apartments and, and hospitality and, and restaurants and bars on the perimeter with the, uh, with the highway. Uh, I went through these slides already. And um, see, so I think the, the other thing is that we're, we're doing here is, uh, is uh, <coughs> bringing um, this to children as well with our National Sailing Club. I think it's, a, it's really a fantastic thing to be able to see the kids who are uh, the, the children of parents buying entry level housing, being able to enjoy being part of a, a sailing club where they um, can benefit from learning from sailors with 30 years of experience. These are types of activities are usually only reserved for children of the wealthiest and so the lagoon and what we're doing here really helps to bring all that together. So um, with that, I'm happy to uh, turn it back over to you, Molly. Thank you. So we're going to go through a, a couple of quick questions for you. Um, but I think a really big answer to a lot of master plans across the country is really just add water. And there's a lot of reasons for that because you can add a lot of density that goes with that. You can add a lot of mixed use, hotel, retail, and all of that stuff becomes much more financially possible. Um, one of the big questions I have for you is, um, Maintenance. Okay, so we talked about the cost to actually build the lagoon. On a monthly, on a monthly basis, how does that impact the HOA for some of these? I know at Balmoral, I was so impressed with how low that monthly payment was. Yeah. How do you offset that? Uh, it's very important for us to keep our communities competitive, and typically our projects are still below some of the, the higher end projects in the city. Um, the, uh, our communities right now, the, the homeowners association, including the lagoon access fee, is $100 per month per, per home, so it's about $1,200 a year. And $400 of the, of the $1,200 is going towards lagoon access. Um, the okay. lagoon is not an HOA-owned amenity, but that payment of that fee helps us become um, break even on the maintenance. Our, our lagoons, I'm mean, just talking about keeping the lagoon clean, not talking about all the other types of things that cost money also like concierge people and sure uh, you know, but keeping the lagoon clean the smaller lagoon would probably be about seven hundred eight hundred thousand dollars a year to keep the, including chemicals That's and great. maintenance you know and then the larger lagoon that we have is between, depending on is around 1.5 1.7 million a year uh, to keep the lagoon clean the the, the lago mar lagoon which is 12 acres are kind of the mothership and and question for both of you how successful would both of those communities have been without the water? I mean, that was such a big part, I think, of Welland Park, and it really almost is the magnet for all of those communities. You know, we, 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 we say waterside vibes. That's part of the, the catch because it's proximity to the, to the Gulf of Mexico right. and then and certainly the widest part of the Mayaca and then creating these large format lakes. Um, you know, it's interesting. We'll wait probably another 10 years to complete the residential core around the water. Just let the, um, just let the market come up to us a little bit. Uh, but you know, at the end of the day, we always say in the retail business, water's magic. So it is. There, that, there's a picture of the tower that, that we did specifically to show the depth of the water at night so they could see the other side of that 80 acre lake. So for us, it's, it's, a, it's a hallmark. I don't think we would be as successful without it. Well, and said differently, what's the premium to your homes today for having Welland Park and the water? And the same question for you for Lagoons, and then we'll wrap up. Too. I would say it's to be determined, uh, though our ASP has grown oof, more than 37% in less than two years. That's fantastic. 
So, and I, part of that's selling the downtown, but it's you know having access to water and related. So it's also market. We're all benefiting from that for sure. It, it how, turned and it turned West Villages or now Welland Park into a place. I hope so. Yeah. For sure. It did. Yeah, I hope so. Thank you. For I, sure, it did. You're I, right. I would say for us, you know, one of the things that's that I've always been focused on is having some t story to tell. People want to buy when they think great things are coming in the future. Um, uh, when I used to develop condos at Related, we talked about Brickell City Center as this big um, mall that was coming and it was going to change Miami forever. But there always has to be some reason that you believe the future is going to be better. And so the lagoons with the future retail, with the restaurants, every time we announce a new hotel, we just sign a letter of intent to build a giant hotel resort at the lagoon we're very excited about. But we, we tell those stories to the future home buyers and they see that these, this is becoming a reality. But to your point, data specific to how does this impact, um, John Ryan gave a great presentation yesterday, Metro Lagoons. I remember that the exact same DR Horton Express home in his community, Epperson, versus the community across the street was selling at a 10% premium. And part of that is because of the lagoon. We were able to take builders before the lagoon was built at Balmoral. We took um, uh, three different builders down to Cabo, Mexico, showed them the lagoon, and we said, hey, we're thinking about building this lagoon at Balmoral. Would you pay an extra $150 to $200 per front foot to own, to, to buy lots in this community if we built this? And of course, part of it's the market and what was happening in time, but everyone agreed to, and that's we generally think of, hey, if we have a lagoon, we can increase the lot prices, the lot Substantially. By $200 per front foot. And then the other thing is to really just, it's all about velocity in home sales. And we, we have been able to prove that certainly we can double the home sales, if not triple the volume of home sales by having this water, Crystal Lagoon's amenity. And um, so that's been, that's really proof in the pudding. We're, and we're able to attract a higher quality builder. Um, so overall, uh, it's been very, it's been, we've seen the data that kind of proves that it, that is, that it helps. It's accretive to the bottom line. Well, I can't thank you both enough. You have to see it. They're both spectacular. I know you're doing a lot of it, Yuri, and Wellen Park and all the stuff that you've touched. Magic. Appreciate it. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. A quick shout out to our founding Sponsors, our friends at Land Advisors and Launch Development Finance Advisors.